So thank you, thank you all very much for coming. Um, my name is uh, Nick Stern. Uh, I'm a professor of economics, IG Patel Professor of Economics and Management here at the LSE, and uh, I chair the Asia Research Centre. This is uh, a gathering which is happening because of the initiative of the uh, British Pakistan Foundation and the Asia, Asia Research Centre. So thank you very much. Um, Ruth Katamuri is here for the uh, Asia Research Center somewhere. There's Ruth coming down, the th coming down the stairs. And we're going to start um, our discussion with a few words from uh, Kashif Zafar from the British Pakistan Foundation. So thank you all very much for coming. This is the moment when you can turn off your mobile phones. And it's also a moment where you can think about your questions the last half hour will be about questions, so you've got plenty of time to make sure that they are brief. Um, I think there won't be any problem uh, in provoking a discussion. One thing that the LSE and Pakistan have in common is that we do not dwell on agreement. So uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty to, to and fro about. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to chair a, a gathering on Pakistan. I first went there about 30 years or so ago, and uh, have been often since in various different capacities. So we will um, start, as I mentioned, with uh, Kashif Zafar, and then we will uh, turn to um, Robert Hathaway. Robert, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Robert. So right after <laughs> Kashif uh, Zafar, we will ask you to say a few words. Because there are six speakers, we're asking everybody, Robert, to hold to about seven minutes if they can, and that way we could uh, finish about 7.30 and open it up to the audience. Is that all right? Uh, I have an ejector seat here, which is uh, rigged to eject me in seven and a half minutes. Okay. I'll be finished by then. Very good. That sounds uh, something to look forward to. Um, so, Kashif, Kashif, could you lead us off, please? And thank you again to the British Pakistan Foundation. Can, can you hear in the back row with that microphone? Uh, should I come over there? Yeah. Uh, well, I think we we're going to need them to work. If you get close, it might work. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Firstly, let me thank you, Lord Stern and LSE, for hosting us this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kashif Zafar, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the British Pakistan Foundation. On behalf of the British Pakistan Foundation and several of our trustees, some of them who are here tonight, um, I welcome all of you to this evening's event um, and to hopefully what is going to be a very engaging uh, and energizing conversation um, with this distinguished panel. BPF is a very young organization. We were launched about a year ago um, in November of 2010 at an event in London which was attended by Foreign Secretary William Hague and the then Foreign Minister of Pakistan, Shah Mahmood Qureshi. At the launch event, BPF raised about 300,000 pounds for flood victims in Pakistan and distributed the money through four local NGO partners as well as UNICEF. While we were engaged in the flood relief work at a very critical time, BPF's mission is to help accelerate the socioeconomic development of Pakistan. We aim to do so by creating a trusted and transparent channel for philanthropy for individuals, corporations, and foundations. And equally, if not more importantly, by harnessing the intellectual capital of the British Pakistani community. I was glad to read in this Woodrow Wilson report that hopefully um, many or all of you have, were able to pick up outside <clears throat> the auditorium that the working group's recommendations um, included um, encouraging USAID and obviously by extension other aid agencies around the world to engage with the diaspora communities. BPF's sister organization, APF, which stands for the American Pakistan Foundation, is engaged across the pond with USAID as well as the State Department. Um, and here in the UK, BPF works closely with FCO as well as DFID. So we've had several meetings with uh, one of our panelists, Mr. Moza Malik. Um, of course, the vital part of our strategy is to engage the diaspora community and other stakeholders by hosting and sponsoring events 
like the one this evening. I hope for those of you who are not on our mailing list that you will join uh, BPF. Uh, our website is very simple, BritishPakistanFoundation.com. And I would encourage the students and the young professionals, who many of them uh, are here tonight, um, to join our BPF Young Professionals Network. Let me now introduce very quickly the distinguished panel. As Lord Sun said, first we'll hear from um, Dr. Robert Hathaway, who's the director of the Asia program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, which produced this report um, that we're discussing today. After him, we'll hear from Dr. Ehtisham Ahmed, who's a visiting senior fellow at the LSE Asia Research Center. He was also a member of the working group for this report. Dr. Ahmed worked previously in senior positions at the IMF, and also till recently was a special advisor to the finance minister of Pakistan. Then we'll hear from Dr. Maliha Lodi, who I think many of you know. Um, she was the f she's the former High Commissioner of Pakistan to the United Kingdom uh, and also a former ambassador to the U.S. After Dr. Lodi, we'll hear from Mr. Shahid Kardar, who um, till recently was the governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. After that, we'll hear from um, Mr. Rashid bin Masood, who was the World Bank Director for Pakistan, among one of the tougher jobs around these days. And then finally, we'll hear from um, um, our, our dear friend, Moazza Malik, who is the Director for Western Asia and Stabilization at DFID. With that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Um, Robert Hathaway. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be a part uh, of this. I want to thank the organizers of this event, uh, Lord Stern. Uh, thank you. Um, also want to acknowledge the uh, important work that Edisham Ahmed uh, has done in organizing this. I think in many ways, um, Edisham was the driving force behind uh, tonight's event, and I'd like to commend him uh, both for his efforts and frankly also for uh, giving the Wilson Center an opportunity to talk a bit about its, its recent report. Um, I gather many of you have a copy uh, of this report, uh, Aiding Without Abetting, Making U.S. Civilian Assistance to Pakistan Work for Both Sides. Permit me, um, if I may, first of all, to emphasize the last three words uh, in that subtitle. This is a report written first and foremost for an American audience. Uh, for reasons which I think you can well imagine. Uh, when we began uh, thinking about this report, uh, now 13 months ago, um, we were very much aware that there uh, was a general feeling, both this country and in Pakistan, uh, that the U.S.-Pakistan relationship was simply not working. Um, not only I think we were right, but it got even worse uh, during the past year. Um, and uh, today it's, it's um, frankly not a very healthy state. Um, on top of the sense overall that the bilateral relationship was not working, there was an additional sense that the U.S. Civilian Assistance Program, uh, known uh, by the names of its principal, uh, congressional sponsors, it's frequently referred to as the Kerry Luger Berman uh, aid package. Um, there's a general sense that KLB, Kerry Luger Berman, was simply not working. Um, every single Pakistani you asked um, would say, What aid program? We haven't seen any aid program. This was two years after uh, the program was supposed to be up and running. So, um, our initiative was motivated by the fact that the overall relationship was in trouble, and as part of this a general sense that the civilian assistance program uh, was simply not functioning the way uh, it was. The third element um, in our calculations leading to the generation of this uh, initiative was the growing uh, fiscal and financial pressures here in the United States, and particularly on Capitol Hill, um, the widespread appreciation that uh, there were going to be significant uh, uh, reductions in government spending um, and our recognition that foreign assistance always is an easy target uh, for members of Congress who seek to, seek to cut spending. Um, so with um, all of these considerations very much in our minds, uh, the Wilson Center organized the 17 person uh, working group, uh, which began to meet last uh, January. Um, 
the chair of this group, um, and perhaps the best decision I made uh, in this whole enterprise, uh, was in selecting chair of uh, Polly Nyack, who probably many of you know. Polly could not be with us today because she is having a medical procedure done. But I want to certainly pay tribute um, to the wonderful job she did in getting 17 strongly opinionated people uh, to agree on a common text. Uh, this report has no published dissents. Um, every one of us agreed uh, to sign on to it, even if we didn't feel fully comfortable with every single sentence in it. Um, Polly deserves the credit for that. We began meeting in the uh, middle of January. We met through the middle of the summer. We met about three times a month. A subgroup of the working group visited Pakistan in May and consulted uh, for a week there with 45 different interlocutors in Pakistan. Um, and uh, one of the things which made our job even more challenging is that events kept intruding. Uh, when we were in Pakistan, for instance, um, uh, the Americans uh, carried out their operation, which took down Osama bin Laden, uh, which, among other things, made for a lively visit uh, for those of us who were in Pakistan then. Um, a bit later in the year, the Pakistani government um, decided to walk away from the IMF um, uh, agreement it had, um, and that really vastly complicated our considerations and forced us to really go back and reconsider a number of issues that we thought we'd already resolved by that time. Uh, a little bit later in the fall, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff made some very provocative public statements uh, about the relationship between the Pakistani intelligence services and the Haqqani network. Um, and so every time we thought we were ready to put this report to bed, uh, events did, as I say, had, had the way of uh, intruding. Uh, and I guess that's just part of uh, the process in one of these uh, types of things. Let me, in one minute, um, simply underscore some of our overarching uh, conclusions. Um, the report argues that as tempting as it might be uh, for many Americans, the United States simply cannot walk away from Pakistan. Again, remember that this is geared first and foremost to an American audience. Uh, the report concludes that a robust program of civilian assistance to Pakistan serves important national interests in both countries. It warns that substantial mid-course corrections um, are required if the Kerry Luger Berman program is to fulfill the hopes uh, of its proponents in either country. Um, it urges, and this is a particularly important recommendation, it urges um, the US Congress not to confuse security aid to Pakistan with civilian or economic assistance, and specifically not to let our agreements, in this, our disagreements in the security realm um, overlap and sour uh, what should be considered a very different program, the economic uh, or civilian assistance program. Um, and then finally, the report um, offers nearly 30 recommendations of a specific, more specific nature. Um, may I say that um, for those of you who didn't get a, a copy of this report, uh, if you would simply Google me at the Woodrow Wilson Center and then get my email and email me uh, a request will be delighted to send you uh, either an electronic copy of the report uh, or a hard copy. Let me conclude, uh, if I may, by simply emphasizing that we uh, undertook this whole project and we regard um, our report with considerable amount of humility. Um, we don't claim to have invented the wheel here. We don't claim to have provided all the answers to what is, after all, a very difficult and complex set of questions. Um, we do, however, um, hope um, that we've offered some constructive uh, suggestions for moving forward. We also feel humble in a more uh, fundamental sense um, because we recognize that at the end of the day, uh, it's Pakistanis themselves uh, that have to decide whether or not their country is going to succeed or fail. Um, the 
U.S. assistance program to Pakistan, while it's big in terms of American budgetary terms, is actually very, very small. Um, and at the end of the day, it's not whether or not U.S. economic assistance moves forward to Pakistan that really matters. It's decisions made uh, within Pakistan. So on that note, uh, I will turn uh, the microphone back uh, to those of you in London, and I look forward to what I'm sure will be a very stimulating discussion. Robert, um, thank you very much indeed, and I hope you're staying with us so you can take part uh, in that discussion. Um, we turn now to um, <clears throat> a very old friend of mine, I mean, a very long-standing friend of mine, um, uh, Etisham Ahmed. We've been working together for well over um, three decades, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to the LSE. Etisham, please. Thank you, Nick. Um, I have a rather provocative title here. It's um, External Assistance, a Curious Case of uh, Dutch Disease Without the Oil. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have, you know, it's a good news story and a bad news story. The good news is that Pakistanis are very industrious, uh, work hard, uh, and they pay taxes, especially when they're not in Pakistan. <laughs> in Pakistan, it's a different story. And the question that I'm going to pose is whether the pattern of assistance over not just 30 years, but more like 60 years, has anything to do with what has become, to me, a dependency culture, and uh, really an approach by government to leverage geographic rents. And does that substitute for domestic effort and for proper domestic policies? So that's the issue that I'm concerned with, and um, I think the Woodrow Wilson report um, actually begins to set the stage quite nicely. It has some very interesting conclusions, and I will pick up on some of these. I'm going to focus on three issues. Um, the effects, not just of uh, recent uh, assistance, but assistance particularly in the 1980s, associated with the inflows for the first Afghan war. Uh, the effects that had on government policy, particularly regarding tax reforms, regarding fiscal responsibility, regarding the approach to uh, what is known as the golden rule and not borrowing for current spending. And of course, the stop-go uh, aid patterns has had an Im impact, and one uh, again commends the Woodrow Wilson School for focusing on that. However, what we have seen since 9-11 uh, in particular and uh, most worryingly, the failure of the tax reforms associated with the most recent uh, IMF program um, jeopardized the two main achievements that this government claims, the Finance Commission and the 18th Amendment, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Also talk about uh, the deteriorating social outcomes and then focus on the need to stand on one's own feet. Let me come to the um, Woodrow Wilson report. I think it's very realistic. The question is, is it enough? And I think the two or three key issues that I take away from it, first is that it avoids a stop-go approach, and I think that, at least for the United States, is important from a political perspective. Um, it emphasizes the need to have sensible policies and avoid capture of aid by interest groups and by politicians and particularly the focus on getting proper cash transfer systems set up and those run through a transparent mechanism or a treasury single account. And again, this is a very essential element in good governance. So I think the emphasis of the report on a treasury single account is very welcome. However, we don't have a treasury single account in Pakistan. And, uh, it also requires, it recommends that all additions to f civilian assistance should require a domestic element. Now, this co-financing is good, it'll get you good projects, but it may not help you uh, get better tax collections overall. It might actually divert attention. So in a sense, uh, it does not ensure additionality of revenues. And this, to me, is the key point. It may still substitute for domestic reform efforts. And you need some conditionality 
on standing on your own feet and doing good for the country that unfortunately uh, has eluded us for the last, at least for the 30 years that Nick Stern and I have been working. This is uh, a very nice graph uh, showing, this is from the Woodrow Wilson report, um, showing the aid in the 1960s, of course, that was the first uh, inflow, and of course, Pakistan benefited a lot from it and used it well. And of course, it, it, uh, it went down, and then after uh, the um, uh, military coup, which brought in Zia, there was a, that was the first time that Pakistan focused seriously on tax reform. It set up a committee headed by Kamrul Islam, and Nick and I gave evidence to this committee. This committee said that the FBR, the CBR at the time, is the most corrupt of institutions, and you will not get reform unless you fix it. It had a series of very good recommendations, including the move to a value-added tax. And this was Kamrul Islam in 1983, picking up on work that Stern and I had done. However, immediately after that, you had the inflows from the United States coming in, and that report was forgotten. The only other time there has been a focus on tax reform is after the uh, sanctions in the late 90s. Pakistan began to hurt, the aid was cut off, and uh, Shahid Hussain, a former vice president of the World Bank and brother of Arthur Hussain, who's sitting there, was asked to come in, and again, he focused on fixing the tax administration. That report uh, led to a $135 million World Bank project. Yeah, $135 million World Bank project. Uh, but again, it was forgotten because you're 9 11. The World Bank project was non performing well before the World Bank called it non performing. World Bank called it non performing in 2008, but it was non performing in 2004 when the government removed the major part of the economy out of the GST net and stopped audit, and nobody said a word. Now, the issue is that you have these declines in US aid, and you would have thought that Pakistan would learn, but I think what is important is not just this table, which is in, in the Woodrow Wilson report, but this table, which superimposes IMF uh, monies when, when, when the US monies are not available. So in a sense, what you have is IMF monies substituting for, uh, for uh, uh, US assistance and a series of failed programs during the 1990s. And then in, the, in 2008, you not only have Kerry Luger, Berman Bill, but you had $8 billion from the IMF, which is augmented by another $3.5 billion in 2009. And where was the incentive to do the tax reform? There wasn't any. And when they promised tax reform, they were not serious. So in a sense, you have promises made, no serious uh, intention of carrying out these promises. And what has happened is that public services in this country have collapsed. Healthcare is now worse than sub-Saharan Africa under virtually every criterion whether it's food security or disease. Education is not on the same planet as India and Bangladesh. We have fallen behind sub-Saharan Africa in educational attainment. So in a sense, what you have is collapsing services. Tax GDP ratio, which in 1983 was 14.5%, in 2011 has come down to 8.6%. And with this collapse in, in the tax GDP ratio, the share going to the provinces has gone down, even though the proportion has gone up. So in terms of GDP, the provinces have less money than they began with. And on top of that, you have devolution, which gives them all the spending responsibilities and no money. So in a sense, what you have is unfunded mandates, which will cement the collapse in public services. So in order to fix that, it's not the foreign assistance that's necessary. It's getting ready to stand on your own feet and tax people fairly and use uh, social policy effectively. I'll stop at that. There is a much larger uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I've only got through two of 20 slides, but I think I'll stop. <laughs> so
Thank you very much, A.T. Sharman. A, a very powerful point made uh, very, very clearly. And now we have Dr. Malia Lodi, who has been not only um, the High Commissioner here in London, but also Pakistan's ambassador to the United States. It's a great pleasure to have you back with us at the uh, LSE. Uh, you're known, if I may say so, Malia, not only for your diplomacy, but also for your insight and cutting edge. And that's why it's a particular pleasure to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I uh, address the audience from here? Thank you. I'm very grateful, Lord Stern, for your kind words, uh, to Aethi Sham for putting this together, and Kashif in particular, and the British Pakistani Foundation. I wish you Godspeed and good luck. I think it's a great venture, and if there's anything that I can do to help this venture, you know where to call me. Um, I want to make a few general points uh, and then look at what the topic of the report is actually, which I think the Wilson Center has done an admirable job in at least getting a debate going about U.S. assistance, which is what the subject of the Wilson Center report uh, is. So let me start by saying that if we frame this issue and ask the question whether aid is a cure or a curse, I think we tend to ascribe too much of a determining role to external assistance, which it doesn't have. Uh, it's all a question of the uses to which aid is put, no question about it. As external assistance or external resources can either supplement a country's own efforts or it can reinforce bad habits, uh, which is a point that uh, Aethi Sham was making. It does not cause those bad habits, uh, nor does it act as a game changer, but it can certainly facilitate a government's efforts if it's interested and serious uh, about reform. So I think we need to, in a way, reframe uh, the, uh, the, the topic somewhat. But having said that, I think I want to reinforce a point that Itisham rightly made, which is that external assistance uh, to Pakistan uh, has been linked and has reflected shifts in global geopolitics and the strategic importance that the United States has accorded to Pakistan. That's the reality. Uh, and the reality also is that multilateral assistance, including from the IFIs, the international financial institutions, has largely followed that pattern. So the pattern has been that the tap of bilateral assistance has been turned on and off, according to whether Pakistan figures in global uh, priorities set by the United States, or the tap is turned off as it was completely in the 1990s. And I make that point really to emphasize uh, the, the, the point that uh, if Pakistan could not do without external assistance, well, we had a whole decade where we had economic sanctions imposed on Pakistan, and Pakistan did not sink. In fact, I think if any of you uh, want to undertake research, a very interesting uh, topic of research could be, did Pakistan's revenue effort actually enhance in this period where there were economic sanctions on, on uh, Pakistan. I leave it, you know, I don't know, I haven't done any empirical work myself on this, but it would be an interesting question uh, to ask. So I think one of the effects that this on-off pattern of assistance has had on Pakistan is to make the Pakistani public very skeptical and very suspicious about both the aims and the purposes of external, particularly bilateral assistance, particularly from the United States. I think uh, while ruling elites have continued to solicitate, the Pakistani public has been increasingly wary uh, of this assistance because they've seen it coming with strings or with strategic foreign policy kinds of strings. So I think we need to keep that uh, point in view. I think when we look at uh, the experience that Pakistan has had in uh, all sorts of financing, multilateral and bilateral, and I think it's a po point Etasham has made and I will reinforce that, Clearly, rather than act as a spur to reform, it's actually given ruling elites an alibi not to reform. So I think we have to recognize that. And uh, we also have to appreciate that this is an unintended effect. Uh, those who want to provide this assistance clearly don't want this outcome for that assistance. But this is what seems to have happened. I think we've seen a reform-averse privilegentia I call it a privilegentia because it's hard to define different kinds of uh, regimes that we've had in Pakistan. But they've all been privileged, and they wanted to retain their privileges, and therefore have been averse and resistant to any kind of reform, including tax reform. 
So the story has been exactly what Edisham depicted. It's created a culture of dependency, but it's also saddled Pakistan with an unsustainable debt burden, especially when we saw over the decades that concessional financing began to turn into more expensive loans. And that is why we today have an unsustainable, frankly, uh, debt burden, unless Pakistan is able to uh, institute policies which are radically different from the past, there is no way out of it. And no outsider can come and sort this problem out for Pakistan. Only Pakistanis can do it. I think the external resources could have been, it didn't have to be this way, the external resources could have been used for Pakistan to have, you know, it gave Pakistan the fiscal space. This fiscal space could have been used by Pakistan to, to change the game. Uh, for itself, but clearly uh, Pakistan was not uh, uh, able to do that. Now let me turn to uh, bilateral and more specifically U.S. civilian assistance um, under the Kerry Luger Berman uh, legislation, which is otherwise known as the Partnership with Pakistan Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act of 2009. How enhanced it is, we will just have a look. And I'm grateful, Bob, that you carried out this very important report, which is enabling us to you know, really have a debate about this today. So I want to make a few points uh, on this. First, something that uh, Bob has also said, that this assistance under the Kerry Luger Act is very modest. Uh, it pledges $7 billion over five years, but it is less than 1% of Pakistan's GDP. It is very modest in relation to Pakistan's economy and its needs. And to put this in perspective, and this is a point that others have made too, it is really the equivalent of five and a half days of US military spending in Afghanistan. Uh, and it's also, uh, the, if you look at the amount that the United States has spent on just the Afghan army alone in recent years, this figure is going down now because of US uh, uh, fiscal difficulties. But they've spent something like $13 billion a year on the Afghan army alone. And here is $7 billion plus that are being given to Pakistan over a five-year period. So I think we need to put this in its proper perspective. It's very modest. And I think even uh, in Pakistan's very challenging economic times, if you just look at the figures of last year, uh, remittances from overseas Pakistanis were about $11 billion. Uh, so that also puts in perspective the seven billion that's being received uh, over a period of five years. But the actual amount dispersed, and I got this figure uh, yesterday from the Economic Affairs Division of Pakistan, so it's an authentic figure. The amount dispersed to Pakistan under Kerry Luger should have been $2.2 billion over two years, because two years have gone by since the 2009 uh, assistance package was announced. The actual amount dispersed was $600 million. And I'm sort of rounding off the figure. It was just under $600 million over two years. So clearly, uh, we are seeing something that is very characteristic of US civilian assistance, which is a large part of it actually never gets, never leaves Washington, because it gets spent on US contractors and US consultants. So we need to bear that in mind. We also, uh, I think, have to recognize that for the Pakistani public, uh, because this assistance has not been concentrated in any visible high impact project, most Pakistanis see very few, very little visible uh, impact or benefit of this. A part of this assistance is going into what is called the Benazir Income Support Program, which is a cash transfer to the poor, which is run by parliamentary members of the ruling party, and therefore is seen by the rest of Pakistan as partisan, because it is being used for patronage and not for poverty alleviation. And I think the more money that will go into this as the election period gets closer, the more people will see this as actually partisan support rather than helping the poor uh, in Pakistan. I think another point uh, that I'd like to make, uh, Lord Stern, has to do with the fact that this assistance was supposed to be an emblem, a symbol, a sign of friendship between Pakistan and the United States. But instead, it has become a source of tensions in an otherwise roller coaster and very turbulent relationship. And if you look at the perceptions on both sides, and this is a point that the Wilson Center report also makes very well, it has resulted in disappointment to both countries, uh, both the recipient and the donor. 
Many in Pakistan believe that this on-off history of the aid relationship and that the assistance that's coming now gives the United States undue leverage, unwarranted and disproportionate. And it's used as a tool to make the country conform to its strategic interests, which may not necessarily coincide with Pakistan's strategic interests. This is the public perception. Not every member of the public has this perception, but it is a view out there, and it's an important view. Others see it as a tool to buy support rather than build support for Pakistan, as a means to either bribe or bully. Others see it as a carrot and a stick to be used sometimes as a carrot and at other times as a stick. I think even the most benign view in Pakistan see, sees this assistance as the emblem of a transactional relationship rather than one based on principle or convergent interests. I think if you look at the perceptions on the American side, they're just as negative. So you see a mirror image. There are members of Congress who get up and say, why are we giving Pakistan all this money? Because they don't do what we ask them to do. They should do exactly what we ask them to do because we're paying them to do this. Um, there are other times that members of Congress threaten to cut off assistance, saying, well, they haven't done and complied with us, so this is what they deserve. There is a congressional move right now to suspend $800 million of the Kerry Luger money, the civilian assistance. The military is completely, the reimbursements, the, what are called the coalition support funds are completely suspended, have been for a year and a half. This is only civilian economic that I'm talking about. Right now, there is a move to suspend 800 million unless Pakistan bans a commonly used fertilizer ingredient that is apparently used in IEDs in Afghanistan. I mean, it's a bit, you have to think about this, think very long and hard, what does this really mean? But basically, what the signal that this sends to the Pakistani people is that this aid is then used in whichever way that the United States wants if members of Congress start putting these conditionalities. Even now, the Secretary of State is expected to certify all sorts of things to uh, Congress before she can actually, uh, you know, yes, before she can actually um, recommend uh, aid, the aid package to Pakistan. So I would say, lastly, that because American security policy and American civilian assistance policy are completely misaligned. You have the economic assistance eclipsed. For example, last year's Pakistan Economic Survey put the cost of the war on terror at $68 billion since the year 2001. So in the last 10 years, the estimate, this is direct and indirect economic costs. And therefore, you can see that this amount completely eclipses any kind of assistance that Pakistan uh, receives, whether it is properly dispersed or not. So I will conclude by saying, you know, raising this question, and I'd be very happy, you know, this becomes a, a point for our discussion today. Are there any options if US bilateral aid produces so much grief for both sides? Are there any other options which are better options? And the answer is yes. The first option is very clear. It's trade, not aid, which is transformative. It is trade that transforms societies, aid really does. And I think opening uh, US markets to Pakistani goods, especially textiles, and eliminating tariff discrimination, because the Pakistani textiles are discriminated against. So we're asking for a policy correction, not a policy concession. And the second is something that I think uh, Itisham mentioned, um, which is if assistance has to be given, then the best way to give it is to give it to multilateral institutions in co-financing for large infrastructure projects that the country is in dire need of. And the third would be co-financing, uh, but this time targeted on education, which is the real game changer in Pakistan. If there's anything that's going to transform Pakistan's destiny, it is going to be education and the ability to provide education uh, to, because Pakistan faces a youth bulge and a huge demographic uh, explosion. And lastly, Something that uh, you know, others have recommended, and I only repeat a recommendation made by others. Uh, this is a recommendation made by the US-Pakistan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they have proposed encouraging investment by giving greater subsidized, uh, sort of incentivizing uh, OPEC, which is the overseas uh, private investment cooperation and Exim Bank operations in Pakistan. In other words, subsidizing credit to them so that they're able to uh, you know, have an incentive to invest uh, in Pakistan. So what I'm arguing for is a different kind of economic engagement rather than this 
kind of civilian assistance which frankly has not worked for Pakistan and has not worked for the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malia. And now, um, it's one thing to talk about fiscal, which is what has been mostly the subject. It's quite another thing to try to manage the central bank when your fiscal is uh, irresponsibly managed and your receipts fluctuate wildly. Now, our next speaker, Dr. Mr. Shahid Qara, has had the privilege of running the central bank in uh, these circumstances. So. Um, it's enormously, and maintaining his independence. So it's a great pleasure to have you uh, with us, Shahid, and we now look forward to your observations. Thank you. Um, very quickly, Lord Stern, um, Ethi Sham had uh, suggested that I talk about the challenges to the economy and the political economy constraints facing the challenges. So I'll just actually shift from um, commenting on the report and civilian systems, which I will weave into my argument. Let me start off by referring to what I call the economic challenges. The first one, as I see it, is the economy settling at a low growth, high inflation equilibrium, because the macroeconomic imbalances that exist now have acquired structural characteristics. Um, I've written a piece on it, which was also distributed and these are three, the budget deficit, the inflation, and the growing pressure on the foreign exchange reserves. And just let me illustrate with one little statistic. Let me shock you. Just one item of expenditure, which is debt servicing, is 120% of the revenues of the federal government. Just one item of expenditure, debt servicing. And uh, contrary to popular myth, I know uh, Malia was also partially repeating it, domestic debt is 10 times more expensive than foreign debt, even today. Let me move on to the second point I want to make. The balance sheet data manifests, in my opinion, the crisis of governance. Everything to me is governance now. Uh, it is the root of all economic problems. The third issue, the th there are a number of crises that have come together. The situation in Balochistan, the pressure which is building up because of a global recession. This is, in fact, impact impacting upon the fourth item I want to highlight. How do you absorb in the mainstream economy 100 million young people with limited education and skills for them to become stakeholders in the system. What could have become a demographic dividend, in my opinion, if we had created a fair and just society, as Malia was referring to, if we had invested in our people, in my opinion, could become a demographic nightmare. Managing their expectations with little room for maneuverability, there's no regular room, will take some doing. Very Fifth, refixing priorities of the state away from a security state paradigm. Six, changing mindsets. We all think that we are too big to be allowed to fail. The reality is that we are also too big a country, 180 million people, for anyone to help us. No one has that kind of deep pockets to help the country of 180 million people, especially when other countries are struggling with their own fiscal and financial problems. B part of that is that we now need to think of a more re robust regional integration. The growing markets, the younger consumers are all in the East. We are trying to sell, as Malia also refers to, trying to sell in aging markets. We should be looking towards the east, and that's where also I future lies in terms of energy and water. So what are the political economy constraints to these challenges? The first one, let's face it, we have a highly selfish elite. This elite is unwilling to give up, give up even the most basic of privileges to retain the rest of it. 
So it's presiding over a deeply polarized society now with two different worldviews. They have been extremely successful to get these repeated bailouts. I mean, they've been very lucky because of events that have taken place in this part of the world. Repeatedly, they've been able to protect their interests. The country, of course, has been in the intensive care unit for a long time, but they've managed to maintain that. Protect their interests and have been successful in postponing reforms. Let me try and illustrate Lord Shrem with three sets of data, very simple ones. The tax to GDP ratio of 8.6%, you'll be pleased to know, is lower than that of Afghanistan. Let me take it further, if it doesn't convey the message. Pakistan now, with 180 million people, has fewer taxpayers than Guatemala, with a population of 14.4 million. 63% of the parliamentarians are non-taxpayers. 3.1 million are people who are actually registered for tax. Let me shock you, last year, only 1.2 million actually filed their returns. Last year, FY11. There are 47,800 corporates registered for tax. Surprise, surprise, less than 16,800 file their returns. Forget what they filed in their returns, okay. The farmers are non taxpayers, but they still insist on subsidies on their inputs. Fertilizer, water, you name it. Okay. So although we have a vibrant media now, it has partially changed the public narrative. There is demand for better quality governance, better quality leadership, partially explains the Imran Khan phenomenon. But still a simplistic view, in my opinion, on what needs to be done. Given the limited room for maneuverability, let me give you three more statistics, which are very critical for you to be able to understand how little room there is. The power losses, the losses of the power sector, are 700,000 rupees a minute, 40 billion rupees a month. Three months of power losses take care of the Kerry Logar bill if the entire money were to come to Pakistan. I couldn't care less for the power, the Kerry Logar bill. Three state-owned enterprises, the Pakistan International Airlines, railways and steel mills lose 200,000 rupees a minute. Okay? So the reality is, how do you explain to the public at large, that's the, po the political and economy constraint, that we have a country, as, as a country have been living on borrowed time, living way beyond our means for far too long. The political challenge will be distributing this pain of adjustment equitably based on the ability of the different social classes to bear this burden. The kind of adjustment that will be required, how you sell that politically, your guess is better than mine. But let me conclude on some hopes. Other than the media, I believe there is a resilient population. The youth is much more assertive. And even the third generation entrepreneurs that I come across now are much more assertive, refusing to grease pumps to get their work done. B, I must agree with both Miliyar and Edisham. External assistance has been a curse. It has postponed reform. I genuinely believe if we are left to fend for ourselves, we may sink. <coughs> but if we are faced with a crisis, it might begin to change, I'm hoping. And the hope is for a leadership with integrity and competence to meet the complex demands of modern governance in the 21st century. Thank you very much. I must say those numbers are absolutely staggering. Um, I was sort of aware, but you really brought it home so powerfully. Um, 
Now, having heard about the problems and possible effects of all this assistance, our last two speakers are from institutions which try to provide assistance. Um, and I think they try to provide it wisely. Um, the challenges, of course, are intense. Um, so first we have Rashid uh, Ben Masood from, as, who is the World Bank Director for Pakistan. And then we have uh, Mirza Malik, uh, who is Director West Asia for DFID. Um, I must ask you to be as fast as you possibly can because um, we do want to have time for discussion. Um, but first, um, Rashid, uh, World Bank Director for Pakistan, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lord and Nixon, uh, friend and colleague. I'm very much delighted to be here today, and I very much thank my friend Itisham for inviting me to this session. And I will be very brief because I think that we will have a sense of a conversation during the discussion. But uh, I just want to think that start on a message of hope and what really inspires me about Pakistan. First, it's a large population with an increasing human resources at working age for productive participation. I'm also very much uh, seeing the vibrant uh, uh, civil society and the private sector. Uh, Pakistan being strategically located at the crossroad of South Asia, Central Asia, China, Middle East, with, with a huge and uh, an huge uh, untapped potential for trade and the hope f of uh, the normalization of a relationship between Pakistan and India. And the world, uh, Pakistan has the world's largest contiguous water system, the, which is the Indus, uh, which is an engine for power, so food supply, and livelihood. And I really strongly believe that Pakistan could be the food basket of the Middle East. There has been some very much successful achievement in Pakistan over the 20th, uh, second half of the 20th century. The Indus water systems, the extensive irrigation system, the hydro development, the scaling up of the power, uh, independent power pro uh, producers, the financial sector, the, its privatization, the telecommunication sector, the national highways and ports. And the World Bank has been a partner to Pakistan since uh, the 1950s, starting with the Indus Water Treaty, which uh, allows the share of water resources between India and Pakistan. Now, there is a huge uh, unfinished agenda that needs to be uh, dealt with uh, in order to meet the challenges of the 21st century. One on the tax and, the, and policies and administration, the <coughs> energy sector, the human development uh, indicators are at the lowest. Managing the, you know, the depleting natural resources, the development in the conflict regions, as well as the state-owned enterprises, which seems to be working more for the employee of the enterprises rather than for the customers. So, with that in mind, I mean, the, you need uh, to uh, the challenges that one will have to look at is basically breaking away from uh, the survival politics, uh, the survival economics, moving from crisis management to uh, managing for, uh, the forward, dealing with the low growth, dealing with jobs, because Pakistan has more than 8,000 job labor who come to the labor market every day. Governance and law and order, and more uh, with serious nature, which is the depleting natural resources, especially in the case of water. So, uh, in for the World Bank, uh, we, you, we had to manage our, uh, our response, and there have been a number of factors that have, uh, have dealt to, uh, that we had to think about. One is the continuously weak macro framework. We have a natural disaster uh, in 2010 and 2011. Pakistan is prone to natural disaster over the last six years. There has been one, das uh, one disaster per year over the last five times. So we, uh, going to forward for the bank, we remain engaged, uh, both on dialogue and a reform front. We are focusing our knowledge and lending uh, services on areas where we can have a greater impact to improve. Uh, the social indicators, we are focusing on health, education, nutrition, and social protection. We are focusing on program and project that have a, a transformative in nature that can generate employment and growth. 
we are very much linking our uh, lending to performance. Uh, that means uh, only when the government perform, then we provide our uh, disbursement. And we are focusing on governance and transparency and accountability for results. I just would like to call, say to my colleague, Ma uh, Malia Lodi, that uh, the BIS program is not managed by the parliament, but it is an apolitical program, and I we can have a discussion on that. Thank you very much, uh, Rashid. And now, um, Mirza Malik, who's director not only for West Asia in uh, DFID, but also for stabilization. Mirza, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> I shall be brief. Um, first, uh, cure or curse? Well, neither. Uh, I think of it as an aspirin. Yeah? It can ease the pain. Uh, it can create space for a cure to work, but in and of itself, it's not a cure. And if you take too much aspirin for too long, it's not good for you. So why is it not a cure in Pakistan? Well, we've heard quite a lot about why it doesn't work in Pakistan. It's a big country. Total aid is perhaps 1.5% of GDP. At most, it's perhaps 3% of the budget. UK aid generous for, in, in, in the case of Pakistan is £1.50 a head. So aid can help at the margin, but it can't solve the problems facing 180 million people. Further, Pakistan's a complicated country, so foreign assistance can't buy change. Ethesham and others talked about uh, the, the series of IMF programs that have been tried in Pakistan on the back of promises which haven't been delivered. The last IMF program, which has lapsed, put $14 billion on the table, essentially for one major change, a tax change, and it didn't work. Mm. Over the years, the US has put billions of dollars on the table for, to buy change on security policy. It hasn't worked. So foreign assistance can't buy change. It can't go against the grain. Change can only happen in Pakistan if Pakistanis decide that they want change, and Pakistanis work out how they're going to make change happen. And that's not about technical solutions. The technical solutions are known. There's lots of reports sitting on the shelf explaining what needs to be done. It's about politics, and it's about political will, and it's about the issues that, that, that Shahid was raising, and it's about building coalitions for change. So what's UK aid trying to do in Pakistan? Well, the first thing I've got to say is obviously that Pakistan really matters to the UK. The UK and Pakistan are deeply connected by history, by diaspora, by culture, by food, um, by cricket. No one's mentioned cricket yet this evening. <laughs> Our objective uh, as the UK government is to help this very, very important partner find a stable and a prosperous future. And our aspiration is for transformative change. So on the UK aid side, on the DFID side, we have a plan that covers a four-year period from 2011 to 2015. We published our operational plan last March. If all goes to plan, our program in Pakistan will more than double, growing from about 170 million pounds a year to more than 400 million pounds a year. And if all goes to plan, that will be the UK's largest development engagement anywhere. We're focused on four issues. First, trying to make democracy work, because you've got to break the, the cycle of civilian and military government for governance to improve. Second, we're trying to help address some of the underlying grievances that have fueled conflict and insecurity in parts of the country. Third, we're looking at how we can support better economic management and economic change and growth. And fourth, we're looking at how we can help the state to deliver some basic services to its people. We've got a huge focus on education. More than half of our program will, it will be focused on education, primary and secondary and vocational. We're trying to help 4 million children get into school over a three-year period. That's roughly 25%, a quarter of the children that are out of school in Pakistan. 
is also roughly the number of children that are in primary school in the whole of England. So it's a hugely ambitious undertaking. But given what I said earlier about aid and, and what you've heard from my colleagues about aid, how are we going about doing this? Well, I want to pull out four things. First, we're trying to work with the grain. We're trying to take our cue from the commitments that are being made by the different tiers of government. We're trying to work with their systems and to support their commitments. And we're trying to leverage their resources, Pakistani taxpayers' resources, which, though dwindling, are nevertheless very substantial. And we're trying to be a consistent and a long-term partner. And this is underpinned on the UK side by our International Development Act, which means that by act of parliament, UK aid has to focus on reducing poverty. It can't be given primarily for security reasons or commercial reasons. It has to be given to reduce poverty. Secondly, we're trying to build a range of partnerships. So in Pakistan, we think about our partnership with the federal government, with each of the provincial governments, with the private sector, with civil society. And our working assumption is that things are going to go wrong. So our modus operandi in our portfolio is to, is, is to be able to scale up where it works and where there is commitment and, 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 and where there are results, but equally to be ready to scale back and to stop where things don't work. Third, we're trying to build coalitions for change within Pakistan. We're talking to politicians, we're talking to political parties, we're talking to civil society, to media, to people. And we're trying to foster coalitions for change because ultimately, as I said before, it's not about technical solutions, it's about, it's about political will, and people need to engage with that. And fourth, uh, we're trying to build international partnerships because we need the international community to actually display a bit more unity of purpose in their partnership with Pakistan. And, and key partners for us in this are the World Bank, the Asian Bank, the IMF, and also the US, though I, you know, the US isn't always easy to, 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 to influence, but nevertheless, they're, they're a key partner for us. And if the Sharm and Shahid will be, and Malia and others will be pleased to hear that the top of our list is no more soft bailouts, because actually the international community hasn't served Pakistan well by offering a uh, resource on, on soft terms. It's a risky endeavor, but as I said earlier, Pakistan matters enormously uh, to, to the UK. And the 38 million people in Pakistan who live below a dollar a day deserve our best shot. And the stability of Pakistan matters enormously, both for Pakistanis but also for that region. So we're there for the long haul. Uh, I think you agree that we've had um, interventions of quite extraordinary quality. Um, we have only a short period now for questions, just about 14 or 15 minutes, so please keep them as short as possible because we want to hear a little more uh, from um, the panel by way of reply. And if I could also ask you to uh, make your questions about, um, as we say in the subcontinent, what to do rather than it's all terrible and difficult. It is very difficult, but let's focus the questions on what we, uh, what we can do. Is a, there are some roving mics. There's a gentleman at the front here. And I'll take uh, three questions. Um, there's uh, a lady right at the back will be number two in, in the red. And uh, third question, this gentleman at the front. <coughs> Khalid Nadeem, South Asia Middle East Forum. Uh, thank you for all your presentations. <clears throat> I've just come from a meeting in King's College which was discussing Afghanistan. Uh, you may be wondering why Afghanistan, I'm bringing this up. The reason I'm bringing this up is because Pakistan was mentioned quite in a, in a very direct way. And I believe that in Islamabad, we need the government and not only the present government, the military, the ISI, need to look at the situation with the drawdown in troops, uh, which is going to take place. I mean, the American administration has said that 2013 is their date. There's a question coming in. Yeah, there's a question coming. Um, if Pakistan does not cooperate in this drawdown, i.e. in influencing the Taliban, in influencing the Haqqani network, in influencing other stakeholders in the region, uh, I believe 
the Americans are going to drastically reduce the aid which Pakistan is receiving at the moment. Already, the US administration is under pressure from Congress and the Senate to reduce this administration. I hope that some action will be taken within Islamabad, that there is cohesive thinking on this. Thank you. You'll have to work out what the question was. But I, I think, okay, I yeah. think I, I, No, no, but I'm going to take the three okay. and then come. Uh, lady at the back, please. Um, good evening, Seema Khan, JP Morgan, and chair of the South Asian Network. Um, could, could you hold the mic closer? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Seema Khan uh, from JP Morgan and chair of the South Asian Network. Um, it's really uh, my comments directed to Mr. Moazam Malik. Um, I, uh, I think the uh, you know, DFID's aims and objectives are very noble. What I would request is that deeper due diligence is done uh, for where money goes and um, deeper follow-up on those results. Um, if I can explain. Um, Briefly, please. <laughs> uh, if, if, if I take an example given by um, uh, you, uh, the former chair of the uh, BPF, James Khan, where he volunteered to go to Pakistan and actually look how B uh, DFID funds were used. Um, he found that yes, uh, schools were being funded, um, but what was happening was, uh, you know, b these organizations were asking for schools to come forward for funding. These schools were already actually successfully f being run and being funded by other means, so the money was just really taking over something that was already successful and uh, working. So it wasn't actually solving a problem, it was just transferring a problem. So, um, you know, that's very, just one very brief example. There are huge educational issues, as we all recognize in Pakistan. I would just ask better and more thorough um, due diligence is done, better and more thorough follow-up is done to make sure that money is actually used effectively and not just ticking boxes and, um, you know, uh, sending back figures to make it look all you know, good and rosy, because that's not what's happening. Thank you. Uh, gentleman here at the front. You need a mic. Uh, a gentleman right here, please. Uh, opportunity to ask a question, because I was wanting to make a statement. Uh, I let somebody else. Okay. Thank you. There's a gentleman just at the front here. Thank your predecessor for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, the aid versus trade one, where in this report one of the recommendations is not to um, do not substitute bilateral trade as valuable as it is for aid. And Malia made a very good point earlier uh, that actually the impact of trade in terms of actual dollars and its trickle down effects seems to be much larger. So I'd like Itisham and uh, Robert to. Uh, give a bit more detail as to why that recommendation is there. Okay. So three questions, <coughs> Afghanistan and the uh, drawdown of the troops, um, due diligence and uh, trade <laughs> and aid. Uh, I, it, it's simply impossible to ask all six of you um, to, to, re to reply. Um, I'm going to make sure that uh, Bob doesn't lose out by not being at the table. But um, Malia, did you want to go first? Yeah. I'll take the Afghanistan one and let my colleagues uh, take the other questions. Uh, I think there's an assumption or a presumption in your question that Pakistan doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, let me set the record straight in terms of peacemaking, because that's what the world is moving towards now, or the Western community and NATO countries are moving towards. The three things Pakistan said 10 years ago, 10 years ago. First, Pakistan said to the United States, don't go to war. Don't punish the Afghan people. You have a problem with Al-Qaeda, sort it out with Al-Qaeda, but don't go to war. Of course, we were not listened to at that time, but this is what we said. So for 10 years, Pakistan has wanted this war to end because it's brought grief to Pakistan, it's brought grief to the people of Afghanistan, it's brought grief to the world, actually. It's also brought grief to the American economy. The second thing Pakistan said was, to the United States and to the United Kingdom and others who were lining up to become part of this coalition, separate Al-Qaeda from the Taliban and talk to the Taliban. We weren't listened to. The third thing Pakistan said, this war is unwinnable. You cannot win when you are seen as an army of occupation. For 10 years, Pakistan was demonized for taking this position. Today, the United States is doing exactly this. 
So the question we would like to ask the United States is, you demonized us for 10 years. Now you want to talk to these people, but six months ago you were saying to Pakistan, shoot them and also deliver them to the negotiating table. And we were saying to the United States, we can't deliver dead bodies, make up your minds. You want to talk to these guys or you want to kill these guys? Um, it, it, it's terrifying how easy it is to go to war. Um, you know, it's very hard to uh, get education expenditure right, but it's very easy to go to war. And you know, we're sitting in the UK that went to war uh, in Iraq, and we saw how easy it was to take that kind of decision, and how difficult it is to get out. Um, but get out, you you must clearly. Um, that's not the view of the London School of Economics, that's my view. <laughs> Mirza Malik, due diligence. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know the specific example that uh, you cited, Seema, on James Khan, uh, but I would like to say that DFID has some of the most thorough due diligence processes of any international agency in the world. Uh, we have tightened them up further in the last 18 months since the election of this coalition government. We have an enormous amount of scrutiny on what we do. Uh, we have uh, an, our own internal audit, of course, but then we also are tracked by the National Audit Office. We have the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament looking at what we do. We have the International Development Committee in, in Parliament scrutinizing what we do. Uh, and this coalition government has set up uh, an independent aid watchdog, which has started operations just a few months ago. Uh, and they are currently, they've just looked at Afghanistan on my patch and they will be looking at Pakistan too. So we have an enormous amount of, of, of scrutiny on what we do and I believe that we have some of the best due diligence processes out there. Um, our Secretary of State is very focused on results because he and we are very mindful that we are custodians of UK taxpayers' money. Uh, and this is, you know, it's a sacred trust. Uh, in, in, uh, in the subcontinent there's a word, amanat, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, taxpayers' money is an amanat, and therefore we're very, very mindful of how well we use it. Um, but I'm happy to look into any specific instances that, that Seema, you or any of the other audience have. Nick, can I also comment very briefly on trade preferences? Because it's a popular line, trade not aid, but actually it, it merits a little bit further thinking. Trade preferences in themselves are being eroded consistently over time. Pakistan pleading its case and winning further preferences is in itself a palliative, the same as aid. It doesn't do away with the fundamental problem that Pakistan faces, which is about the competitiveness of its economy and the quality of its economic management. So trade, not aid, yeah, fine, but actually, reform. Thank you. Um, Bob and Eti Sham, very quickly, please, and then uh, we may get a chance for one or two more questions. Bob, can you hear us? Oh, and Shade. So, no, no, Bob. Bob oh, oh, no. no Bob, no, Bob, no, Bob uh, Shade was kindly pointing to your picture. <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm delighted to get in this. Let me first of all say um, it's been a real privilege to be on a panel with such distinguished and knowledgeable and articulate uh, speakers. Um, on the question of aid versus trade, it of course is the same sort of false choice as, for instance, the subtitle of our program today, Cure or Curse. Um, you know, they're, they're straw men, just trade versus aid is a straw man. What we want in aid is smart aid, uh, what will be either a cure nor or a curse. Uh, with trade, um, our recommendation was not to minimize the importance of aid. Indeed, um, in other venues, um, I have written a number of places um, calling for uh, better access to the American market for Pakistani goods. I'm all in favor of more generous treatment of Pakistani goods by uh, the United States. Um, but I don't think very many people really can argue that increased trade um, is a full-fledged and total substitute for aid. Our recommendation was simply to avoid false choice. Um, that if we, in fact, liberalize um, our 
uh, uh, tariff and, and other sorts of uh, barriers, um, we then can simply forget any obligation to provide aid. That, that was the purpose of our recommendation. Um, later, someone called for looking for alternatives uh, to bilateral economic assistance. And in a way, um, trade not only with the United States is one alternative, but even more importantly, um, and I don't know a single economist who disputes this, um, increasing trade with Pakistan's nearest neighbor, or nearest large neighbor, India. Um, every analysis I've ever seen suggests that if the trade relationship between Pakistan and India is normalized, this is going to have vastly greater um, uh, influence for good in Pakistan um, than either a modest bilateral aid program or um, the modest increase in trade that might come from the liberalization of the U.S. regime. So it's all of the above, sir. Thank you, Bob. Eti Chum. Um, the trade versus aid issue relates, I think, very much to the efficiency question. Should you be producing what you're producing? And unfortunately, I think it has to be looked at as part of a political economy problem because you've had the vested interest running infant industries. These infants are now 65 years old and they have not grown up. And these infants continue to require the tax holidays and the subsidies that are eating away at the fabric of the governance issue. So uh, when uh, the IMF programs were, uh, were actually established in the 1990s, each one of them failed because the governments, and this includes both parties, didn't want to tackle uh, the issue of the sacred cows. They had these tax holidays, they had the holes in the tax system, they had the subsidies, uh, which continued. And finally, when they got something close to uh, an arm's length tax administration and they reduced the tariff barriers which were protecting these industries, well, what did it do? They took all these sectors out of the VAT net in 2004, which is one way of protecting them without the WTO noticing. What it, what it did was collapsing the, uh, the public finances of this country, and that haven't recovered. So the issue really is not so much uh, trade, but getting efficiency is something that the Indians have done and we have not been able to do because they have a tax system which is fair and generates efficiency and competitiveness. I'd like to come back to the issue of um, the governance again, because I think um, you can, UK can look at the projects, the World Bank can look at outcomes for their projects, but money passes through the government chain and disappears. Pakistan does not yet have a treasury single account, in spite of the fact that this was one of the preconditions in the IMF World Bank program of 2008. This was, a, this was the concept of a consolidated account existed in British days. It was abandoned in, 19, in the mid-1980s when you had this huge inflow of uh, assistance. So one of the things that, the, Kerry, uh, that this uh, Woodrow Wilson report talks about <laughs> is getting a treasury single account. So you know where the money is going. You don't know where the money is going today. In spite of the fact that it's been another World Bank project, another 100 million plus to track spending and you'd still can't track spending. So where is this money? In 2008, Mr. Dar was finance minister. He found that there were 10 billion, 10 billion dollars in government bank accounts. At the time, they went to the IMF for 8 billion. Sitting there. So, you know, and it's still sitting there. Thank you, Adi Shum, um, for <laughs> underlining the problems. Um, we have not got any time for any more questions. The, one of the reasons is the enthusiasm of our panel to answer uh, your questions. I was asked to say a few words at the end of what I take away from all this, so um, I'll, I'll give you two minutes of my own reactions to what we've heard. 
Um, the first thing is that size matters. Um, Pakistan is a very big country, and what happens in Pakistan will be shaped by Pakistanis. Um, that uh, is something which I think we should constantly remind ourselves of, and indeed we have been constantly reminded of during the course of this discussion. Outside assistance can make a difference and um, can contribute positively, um, but it seems has not always done so. But the uh, happenings and the future of Pakistan will be determined within Pakistan. That takes us to the question which everyone has agreed on, which is governance. Um, how do you change governance? We've uh, understood that it's difficult and that the vested interests are deep and strong, indeed extremely powerful. And I think that obviously many people here, indeed probably the majority here who come from Pakistan, many of us have worked in Pakistan. And I must say the power of the vested interests is impressive by international standards. This is the big league of vested interests. So um, what do you do in those uh, circumstances? Well, it's not impossible, and I think we're all here because we believe it's not impossible. There are no exact parallels, of course, but there are other experiences. I mean, many of us 15 years ago would have despaired of Bihar. Um, that has started to change. Um, it's changed through uh, leadership, but it's changed through the democratic processes, and uh, Pakistan still does have democratic processes, and it has people with strong opinions who can express their views. They don't always work that well, and you've got the military standing in the background. Um, those are important uh, elements of the whole story. But you've got a court system that is not completely supine in Pakistan. So if you look at the elements of active politics, um, a court system that's not dead, uh, the people you see on this platform of quite extraordinary quality and distinction who have as good a chance of running any country, including Pakistan, as anybody else, and they're not alone. We all know that there are many more people of that quality in Pakistan. So it is not hopeless. You cannot assume that governance and vested interests are destined to dominate indefinitely, that bad governance and vested interests are destined to dominate indefinitely. So how to change? Well, we've seen some of the elements here. Uh, there's the long story, which is surely extremely important, which um, I think all the panelists emphasize, which is education. That's the long game, and it's absolutely vital. And you can see effects um, in 10 or 15 years. You can't see them in one or two. But you have to play the long game because this is a long story. That surely is uh, very important. You can support things that work. Because it's a big country, there will be places where the chances of making a difference are higher than others. And there's nothing more important than the power of the example. Again, we've seen that as a theme. Find those that you can work with, make a difference uh, there, and uh, recognize where you're not making a difference and focus where you are. So I think we're seeing the elements of the story of how governance uh, can be changed, how you can get a different kind of momentum and leadership. Um, but what actually happens, of course, will be influenced uh, in really not just large measure, virtually entirely by the uh, politics and people of Pakistan. I do believe that the, outside, uh, the outsiders can help. They can help if they understand and follow those who are analyzing inside. Uh, the willingness to make the changes will, I think, come with example, but it will also come with a recognition that as those changes come, there are those who are willing to help and uh, get, get behind them. I must say I've learned a great deal through the course of this uh, hour and a half. 
Uh, I haven't been to Pakistan for about 10 years. It reminded me of how much fun that country is, <laughs> as well as a country with uh, great difficulty. And it took um, a member of uh, the British Civil Service to refer to the cricket. I was going to avoid the subject altogether. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've said enough about cricket already. Um, other than the last time I chaired a meeting on Pakistan was with uh, um, about six weeks ago when Imran Khan came to speak uh, in the uh, old theatre. And I have to confess, um, as someone who's followed cricket all my life, I did get his autograph in his book. <laughs> <laughs> but I know we're going to have a very lively uh, dinner conversation. In, as I say, in good LSE and Pakistani tradition, we will not dwell on agreement, and I look forward. But to continuing that discussion, sadly, you won't be there. <laughs> but I hope that you will join me in thanking our panel for an enormously stimulating discussion. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, Bob. <laughs>